Okay, well, everyone, thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm really excited that, that we get to have this discussion tonight. Um, just, just as background, like, I've been feeling for a while that as, as students at, this, at the School of Architecture, that it would be good for us to pay closer attention to the city that, that we're actually living in and, and just really sort of look at Cambridge and, and kind of understand what's going on in, in more detail um, in, in thesis research and in various other projects. We, we often think about and, and deal with complex social issues kind of elsewhere, but, uh, but I think like, well, I personally often lack understanding of, of what's, I think, going on right in front of my eyes. And I think it's more complex than we realize a lot of the time. So that's why I'm really excited tonight that Philip Mills, uh, Phil, is able to, to be here with us. Um, I had the, the privilege of, of getting to, to know Phil last year through, uh, through a church group. Um, and I think, I think Phil's a really good person to, to talk to us about this. He has some, some really interesting local experience. Um, until recently, he was the, the executive director of the Greenway Chaplain Community Center uh, in Cambridge, um, providing various kinds of services to the community. And right now, he's the executive director of the Independent Living Center of Waterloo Region. And so he has kind of real on-the-ground experience seeing what's going on in this community and, and kind of the dynamics of, of poverty and, and homelessness in this, in this area. So this is, a, this is a first conversation around this subject. I'm, I'm hoping it won't be the last one, and, and maybe we can, we can talk to other people who are doing work in the region um, around these issues. But yeah, Phil, thanks so much for being here. And I guess I'll kind of turn it over to you. Sure. Uh, thank you for having me. I'd love to get to come and chat with folks about stuff that I am passionate about and I find interesting. Um, so I'll give you some background and uh, what kind of what I do and where I'm coming from. Um, I just in July transitioned to a new role. I spent the past five years working here in Cambridge um, as Samuel said, as the executive director of the Greenway Chaplain Community Center. It's one of the neighborhood associations in town. Um, so registered charity, and uh, what we did is we did a mix of social and recreation services for our catchment. So we had an area which would be, do you guys have a good sense of Cambridge? Or, eh? Yeah. <laughs> so our boundaries were Hesper Road, Franklin Road, um, kind of the Delta, and then the top of the mall. So that box was the community that I worked. Um, densely populated, by and large, would be considered one of the, um, by most metrics, one of the poorest areas in the region. So kind of, you'd be in your top kind of neighborhoods in the region, probably top five, six of the poorest neighborhoods in the region. Um, a lot of that related to uh, the types of homes that are available. Really small, low-income homes, a lot of also uh, co-op housing and a few other things. So the population that we're working with was uh, by and large folks are experiencing some measure of poverty. Um, so did that for five years, and we did everything from after school programs to free legal support to free counseling. We supported people with um, food security, all that kind of stuff, as well as um, you know try to reduce, you know, try to increase their access. It was built out of what's known as a community development model. So we would go out, engage the community, and then hopefully with their support. Um, bring in the types of supports in that would meet their needs. So our work was around trying to keep them engaged and then try and kind of uh, empower them as a community to make the changes that they wanted to see and to have the access to the services they need. Our role was around reducing barriers to access by and large. So when they identified the need for legal supports, our, you know, and where that could come from, our work was then around how do we reduce their barriers to access because access and those types of things can be really hard, especially if they're centralized in Uptown Waterloo. It is, I don't know if you guys have tried on a bus to get to Uptown Waterloo. Not a lot of fun. Um, tack on a couple of kids and, you know, needing to be back to pick up a third kid from uh, school at the end of the day, and it becomes almost impossible to make those types of things work. So our work was around making that stuff accessible so they could have access to those types of things that would be uh, meaningful to them. Uh, the work I do now is uh, specifically focused on people with uh, permanent physical disabilities. So we do a uh, myriad of different supports uh, from what we would call assisted living, so on-site uh, supports in a housing complex to outreach supports where we go into people's homes, wherever they may be, to provide them support with their activities of daily living. So both uh, populations 
that I've kind of spent the past number of years working with experience measures of poverty, marginalization, that kind of stuff. Prior to that, I did some work with residential drug treatment. So kind of had a gambit of social services experience over the past, I don't know, more years than I would like to count, I guess, is maybe the best way to put it. Um, and then before that, I did a bunch of work with youth around youth engagement and specifically engaging hard to reach youth and uh, that sort of thing. So that's my background. Um, I have three kids. They are four, three, and one and a half. So if it looks like I'm starting to glaze over, it's because I've been, you know, deprived of sleep for about five years. <laughs> but someday, I'm told they'll uh, sleep. And uh, I live in Cambridge. I live up in the Preston area, kind of near Preston High School. If you go up King Street, kind of towards the 401, up near where the Dairy Queen is, that's my neighborhood. So I live up in there, and I've been there for the past kind of two and a half years. So it's a bit of background about me. Um, and so when I was talking to Samuel, we kind of met for coffee a couple of weeks ago, just chatting about what's kind of going on here. And there's a ton of things we could talk about. And I'm just kind of interested if I can get a bit of a pulse. What were you expecting when you came tonight? <laughs> <laughs> so here's this thing. We're going to talk about poverty, homelessness. We're going to talk about you know, the local community. What were you expecting? What did you want to know? What don't you know? What's going to interest you? Because we can talk about, kind of said, like, there's a myriad of lenses we can use to approach it but I'm interested in what's gonna resonate with you guys and we'll kind of start from there and see where kind of the conversation goes. Ideally, I'd like to not talk at you for like an hour. <laughs> Rather have that be more of a dialogue between us around what's of interest to you, what you're wanting to know and see if I can provide some context and maybe a, a different lens or perspective or two to help with what would be beneficial to you. So, yeah. Well, my thesis is actually looking directly at how um, space and like the, a sense of place underlies um, issues of addiction and mm -hmm. homelessness. So just like, I, and I'm hoping, I, I think my direction right now is to kind of look at um, Toronto, Vancouver, and Cambridge. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, this is like exactly what we need. Sure. <laughs> um, Any other thoughts on kind of what you were hoping for or what was going to be of interest for you folks? Yeah. Uh, I was interested in what I don't really know the facilities here, specifically in Galt. I know that there's something up near our uh, Grand House, um, a facility there, but in terms of like shelters, like what is around? Because mm -hmm. often living in the downtown here, you walk around at night and you see people sleeping in the banks. And so I was just wondering, like, is that because the shelter is too full or it's not necessarily available to them or what would be causing something like that specifically here? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so we're going to hold on to that one. Kind of yeah. Rest of them will kind of give me a sense of where to go. Any other thoughts? Yeah, another thing. Like, we often do projects in Cambridge, like hypothetical sure. studio projects. Mm -hmm. It would be interesting to get your input on if there were to be like new infrastructure mm -hmm. around this topic, like what would it be, what's needed in this area? Because yeah. sure. we've, like, we've been assigned hotels, to design a hotel for Galt, mm -hmm. but like Another thing that you mentioned about this zone having a lot of low income yep. housing, like, wouldn't that necessarily mean that there's less of a chance of homelessness? Or is, like, I'm, I'm curious to know, like, how a region's kind of market would play into that, or if does sure. it matter? Yeah. <laughs> I asked. <laughs> Okay. 
also curious about if we can talk more about the community development model mm -hmm. that you've been working on. Sure. Um, Yes, yeah, so we'll, we'll start with a bit of a, a discussion kind of around what's here. Maybe that's the easiest place to start. So, um, in the simplest form, whatever you would expect to be in a big city does exist here. We are a relatively large you know, area, specifically when you start to think of greater Waterloo region. So, um, I don't know, two and a half blocks from here is the bridges, which is the shelter. So it's up on your right, across from the, if you're going up, uh, Ainsley, it's on your right across from the Shoppers Drug Mart. It's the one near Grand Hill. Yeah. yeah. So that's, that's the Bridges Shelter. So that shelter is accessible, but um, shelters are kind of a fickle thing. Uh, there are, for lots of good reasons, rules around what needs to happen in a shelter, and those rules can make them hard to access or hard to maintain in. So, um, you know, if you've got somebody who has an addictions issue, shelters are hard to stay in because you can't have your drugs in there. And if you have your drugs in there, you're going to get kicked out because it's not safe. And there's lots of good reasons why that's not safe, but it makes it a tough space to be in. So you might be running into why are there people on the street because they're not allowed back at the shelter. Um, and folks who are in that particular situation, when it comes to homelessness, um, much like, I don't know if you guys know anything about healthcare, you kind of have, it's an exponential curve around use. So homelessness is exactly the same. So by and large, somebody who access as a shelter, they would say, of the number of people to access, I think the average stay was something like three days for all users. But you've got people who are going all the time for the better part of their life. You had like a very small percentage of users accessing a massive amount of the resource because of a whole myriad of systemic reasons why they can't get somewhere and they can't kind of land and feel safe and settled. So you've got people that will, for reasons that are beyond their control, loss of a job or um, you know, an eviction notice. They might be homeless for a day or two, they get settled, they get support, and they're back on their feet and they're pretty good to go. And they're often not back into the system. There are, however, those that are persistently homeless. And so when you're talking about addressing homelessness, by and large, the goal is around those who are persistently homeless as opposed to just somebody who happens to be you know, precariously housed. So for instance, if you're, let's think of a good example. Um, Oh, so in my spare time, which I have a ton of because I have three little kids, uh, <laughs> my wife and I own a property up on Water Street, which we uh, rent. It's a duplex, and we rent the units to people coming out of the shelter. So trying to you know, add to the amount of accessible housing. There is not a lot of accessible housing within the region. Kind of to your point, I want to say that if you are a priority case, it's like a year wait list if you're a priority case. So if you have some sort of reason to kind of get bumped to the top of the list, it's not gonna happen quickly. Like people are on the list looking for, um, you know, rent geared to income housing for years. So it is a massive problem within. And from not having housing, a whole bunch of your other stuff starts to kind of spiral out from that. There's a model they talk about when they're working with um, supports for people experiencing complex issues, where they would talk about housing first, home first. You guys ever, just ringing in? Yeah? yeah, some nods, some not. Okay, the idea being, if you have somebody that has, say, a drug addiction issue, you can't just say, let's treat your drug addiction issue and then send them back out onto the street. You have to find a way, because that often is what happens. Here's this person, they're precariously housed or they're not stably housed. They get some support and then go back to the situation that caused them to kind of spiral into the situation in the first place. So if you don't have somewhere safe to be, tend not to make really great choices. And so there's this idea around where housing first, but what needs to happen or some of the arguments to be made is that if you give people a home, the rest of the stuff you can then start to address. But until their housing is stable, the rest of the issues, you're kind of beating your head against the wall. Now, there's some good research around that. Um, if you want like an easy primer, there was a really interesting article uh, a year or two ago done by Mother Jones. On, uh, you can find it on their website. And it talked about what they did around persistent homelessness in Utah. Um, I believe it was Salt Lake City. And a whole bunch of the government and then the Mormons got together and they just built a bunch of low income houses and gave people homes. They said, this is your apartment, it's yours, you kinda can't lose it. And what their goal was to say, these high end folks, the exceptionally persistent homeless, let's give them what they need so then we can start addressing the actual needs around them. So we can start to deal with their mental health concerns, start to deal with 
um, the things that are causing them to spiral back into and kind of be persistently homeless, part of the issue was we can't fix those until their actual housing is set. So it's known as a housing first model. There's pros and cons, and people will say it doesn't really work. But my experience has been that it's been relatively positive for most people who have stable housing. You start to have the other options. Um, so, um, so that's one of the issues that's, you know, when we're talking about Cambridge specifically, there isn't a ton of that, more often because there is such a great demand for housing. Um, and some of that demand comes from a whole bunch of reasons. You could look at um, minimum wage. You know, if you are a friend of ours that we met um, through a, a community group, she was working a full-time job, minimum wage. He was working a full-time job, minimum wage. They had kids, and they couldn't afford to live. It just doesn't exist. You're kind of thinking, I think, I think you end up kind of netting out somewhere around 20 ish thousand dollars a year, give or take, if you're on minimum wage after taxes and all those sort of things. And you've got two people making that, trying to support kids, home, family. Like, it, it doesn't work. You have to pay any child care. I don't know if you guys know what child care costs. It's ludicrous. So if you are somebody who would be, the term they kind of use is, uh, they would use working poor, though they're kind of playing with those terms. People are kind of balking at the term poor for, uh, a lot, a lot of uh, folks are kind of balking at that. One of the things that the concern is is that if you talk about somebody who's a working poor, they can't access much of the system because they make too much money, but to maintain their employment, they have to pay a whole bunch of money. So if you want to work full time and you have like a three-year-old, you have to then pay for childcare. You can't live off the $12 an hour you're making anyway, and now you're shelling out 35 to $40 a day just for the childcare. You know, you're working an eight-hour shift. like. You're, you're netting out almost nothing when all this is said and done. So what are your options? You're not necessarily skilled enough and you don't, haven't have a great you know, job history. You need to get a job somewhere because if you don't get a job, you go on to OW and then everybody says that you're you know, lazy and mooching off the system. So the person's working hard and the family's working hard and the system actually doesn't allow them a lot of opportunity to get into something safe, to get into a home, to maintain a home, to buy a home, to gain equity, to do any of those sort of things. They're constantly renting these places that aren't particularly great for them or that are not accessible or there aren't a lot of. So the whole system kind of conspires around keeping people relatively precariously housed. Um, and, in much, and then, again, the other stuff starts to pour out of that then. And part of that's because, A, the system, you know, lots of things with the system don't allow people to make much money. And there are those stigmas attached to the types of supports that exist. OW is Ontario Works, which some people would know as welfare. Um, Anybody know anything about OW? So let's just take a guess here. If, you know, let's assume you are a couple. So you and a partner, you have applied for Ontario Works, you've been trying, you can't kind of find a job, the market's terrible, don't have a ton of skills, so you're applying for Ontario Works. Monthly, what would you expect to get for your, to kind of meet your basic needs? Take a stab, what do you think you would get? So five hundred dollars a person, so the couple would get a thousand dollars a month. Other thoughts? Any guesses? It's quiet. Not bite. I would say around the same neighborhood. About a thousand. What do you think? Any other guesses? It's like four hundred and seventy dollars a month. For a couple. For the whole. That's what the couple gets. Together. Together. Yeah. That's the max they can get. Okay. So that's if, if they start working, and then you if they yeah, so if they got a job, it comes off of that. Yeah. Now, that's their that's so that's their basic. That's what they call their discretionary benefits. There is a stipend that they can get for housing, which supports their other sort of things. Um, but unless you're in a rent geared to income housing, by and large, that doesn't actually cover what your rent costs. So then you start taking off your four hundred and some odd dollars, your rent. That's a great question. How are you supposed to do anything? How are you supposed to stay in a house? And that's where you start making those trade-offs. So you ever kind of see, I don't know if you remember, if you guys, were, I watched too much TV. Uh, I don't remember years ago, there was commercials that started talking about the choice between like food and electricity, or they were kind of like, a person was either eating 
or they were like turning on a light or like sitting outside in the or sitting outside because it was like electricity or housing. You couldn't have both, or you couldn't have food and a car. Like those trade-offs happen all the time because the amount of money that you're allowed to have, the amount of money you're given is ludicrously small. Moreover, to get onto something on Ontario Works, you can't have more than I think it's thirty-five hundred dollars in assets. So if you happen to own a car, like that's it. You can own nothing else of value. If you have savings, you have to get rid of all of your savings before you can get the support from Ontario Works to then have the privilege of getting 460 some odd dollars a month for you and your partner to try and live on. So that's why when you start to have that sort of an issue happening, when you've got a recession that's occurred over the past number of years and employment being hard, or so even if you're working, you know, working isn't working poor and you're working a, you know, a minimum wage job, it's hard. If you're not there, you're going to have access to something like OW, which is just as hard. Neither of them is particularly great, but there aren't a lot of options. And who's hiring somebody without experience or who's only working minimum wage jobs? And where are you going to live then? Because you can't really afford anything. And these are the types of things when we talk about cycles of poverty. This is how that stuff gets created. And so it, it systemically creates this problem that then says, OK, so you've got you know, a partner and a couple. And let's say they have some kids. They've never had a lot of opportunity. They're probably not going to be encouraged to go to school because they were never encouraged to go to school. The idea of opportunity, the idea of kind of feeling like they have a chance at anything doesn't exist for a lot of those folks. And so that kid then grows up and goes on to OW themselves because, you know, that's kind of all they know. That's all they've been taught. That's all they've been able to be supported for. And so the need for low-income housing, those types of things, continues to grow because you've got a population that, isn't a lot, that doesn't give a lot of options to kind of get out of poverty. There's this gap that occurs where if you're on Ontario Works, you have some supports. You have a drug card and some other things that you know, give you some supports to make it more manageable. So what that means is that even if you could get a minimum wage job, it's actually not advantageous for you to do so. Because now you lose access to systemic supports. You lose access to a drug card. You lose access to all these sort of things. By virtue of getting this job, you actually have less access to supports for you and your family. So there's this gap where, even or if you're working minimum wage, like you need to say if you're on Ontario Works, you can't just go to find a job. You have to find a job that's going to give you all that you have and a little bit more because what's the incentive to do that then? So there's you and your kids. Say you're a single parent. You've got two kids at home. And you're kind of thinking, you know, they're in school. I could go get a job. Then I have to you know, cover child care on either end of the day for them when they come home for school. And... I'm going to have, not going to have drug coverage or dental coverage for them as kids. And my kids are going to need dentistry. And where am I going to get a job that's going to give me benefits and have the opportunity? And I'm actually home for the day. I can see my kids in the morning. I can pick them up from school. There's some social benefits to this. So the idea of how to move from OW onto something else becomes really problematic. Because again, you're not actually allowed to gain income. Like we kind of said, even if you get a job, it comes off of that. And so how do you balance that out? So there's this massive gap issue where you need to go from that to a relatively well-paying job with benefits, which almost nobody can find, to make that leap or the investment into that heart. And that becomes disenfranchising. You try and try, and you don't get that, and you can't find it. And so it just becomes hard to move beyond that. So you have a parent that was never able to get a job, you know, with kids that never saw their parents work, didn't understand why. Their parents say it's because the system sucks, because it does. You know, they're not given the types of supports that an engaged parent often can because they're doing all the things they can to try and, you know, scramble to put food on the table. They're spending their day trying to figure out how they get enough food for the family, let alone trying to work a job. And you have these cycles of poverty, that kind of cycle. And that stuff happens, like, right here. It's, like, depressing, but it happens right in this community all the time. There are thousands of people that that is their existence. Just with the, the amount that people get for OW again, why is it so low? <laughs> uh, well, there's, so there's a political reason, but there's actually, there's a, I, have an, I have an idea. Uh, I feel like you're priming me to say this. A little. A little bit. Um, it's, my impression has been it's so low because we as a society don't value those people. Somebody's experienced poverty we don't care about because they haven't earned it. 
They're going to sit there and like, get paid to do nothing? Sit at home, not work? I have to work. Why do you get for nothing? You're going to take my ta- I pay taxes, and you get to then just live at home doing whatever you want all day? No, that, that number is never going up. Because that comes from hardworking people that actually earned it. We're not just going to give this to people. We're going to give it away. We're not going to benefit people who are lazy and don't care. The irony of it all is, um, there was a really interesting article, or was a, I think it was an Outliers. Anybody read any Malcolm Gladwell fans? Talks about a guy out in, I think it was Malcolm, getting my articles mixed up. I do more reading than I probably have time for. Um, talking about a guy out in California, who is the quintessential example of this. He cost the system over like the you know, seven years they followed him, something like a million dollars. It was one person because he lived on the street, he would get drunk, he would then get picked up by the cops, dropped at the hospital, and then go out the next night and do the same thing again, eating up massive numbers of expensive services. So the answer there is to say, well, when he was in a rehab program that was exceptionally structured, he was fine, didn't bother the system at all. So what you could say is, this gentleman's costing the system, let's say, a million dollars over 10 years, so $100,000 a year. Do you think for, I don't know, $60,000, you could keep him off the streets? You could give him an apartment. You could pay a full-time social worker to watch him. It's cheaper. Give him an apartment, give him a salary, and pay a full-time social worker. is cheaper than what they're currently doing with this particular gentleman. And that happens all the time with the type of people that are persistently accessing services. But could you imagine what would happen if our fix to homelessness was, we're just going to give free homes and free money to people that can't sort it out? It'll never happen. Because they haven't earned it. They don't deserve that. And so our sort of self-righteous perspective on what they earn or deserve as a person means they don't get to have something. And we're willing to pay more in taxes to make sure they don't get that. You look at the social systems that exist. The number of people that are eating up the services when it comes to health care, when it eats eating up services when it comes to you know, social services, the supports, the bridges. You could put them all, build a building. You guys are architects. You could build a building. You could build into it in the basement or in the main floor all of the types of supports they would need. There could be addiction services, you know, offices for addiction, offices for you know, employment supports. All those things in a building they could live in for free would be cheaper than what we're currently doing. But politically, the idea of just giving a bunch of people free housing and free money doesn't work because they don't deserve it. And so our taxes are higher than they need to be for a system that doesn't even work. I think though you sometimes have issues when you decide to give handouts. Like I totally understand where yep. you're coming from. But like when you give a handout to someone, they take that and they feel like it's not empowering. It's not empowering to just be given something without having to work for it. And I don't think working for it is like being homeless and sleeping rough, like that's not the solution, but there is kind of this interesting like play of like, yeah, it, it might be cheaper just to hand out, but handouts don't work as well. I, I agree. So there are some, there are aspects of it that don't work where you would say like you need to have, you want to have somebody investing and showing investment, but what we'd expect as investment is exceptionally low. Mm-hmm. And I think that's partly where we kind of get into the threshold issues. There's an interesting... So my background is actually in recreation, which is where I started. Um, and I remember there was a case study that talked about a park in, in downtown Philadelphia, perhaps, that was constantly destroyed. It was never kept up, you know, lots of gang activity, those sort of things. So they made entrance to it, 10 cents, and it was never a problem again. Because that was enough of a barrier. So it's kind of your point. People took, you know, this something is important, but what the something needs to be Sometimes we would say it needs to be a lot more than it does. That we don't actually, or again, can we empower people in a different way to make the something something they can actually give or something they can actually pour back into? Talk about, um, you know, kind of to your, there was a question or a comment about kind of the model and the way that we work with community development sort of things. That's where you can start to tie that kind of stuff in. So we go out into the community and say, what do you need? You can empower and build personal capacity in people to pour back into their community. And they get engaged. They want to do better. Um, and you can do those types of things, but you need 
long-standing, consistent supports to make it happen. That type of stuff takes relationship building, which takes a lot of time, which takes consistent funding, which tends not to exist for a lot of these things. They kind of come and go with governments as to what's trendy and interesting, and so consistent problems exist. We have like an interesting example. There was a woman who lived beside us at the community center. First two years that I was there, I had no idea who she was. Never came out her door. Um, she came over because she was out of food and you know, asked us for some supports. We eventually got her uh, connected and kind of involved. She started out by volunteering as our reception. She would kind of come and hang out for a half an hour or for a morning and answer phones and you know, play on the internet because she could. By the time I left, she was volunteering something like, on average, 35 hours a week, pouring back into the community, pouring back and everybody knew who she was, giving back. Part of that was creating space and opportunity and time to go out and invest in somebody. And so those types of things exist, and we could create those same types of models and systems, and they do exist, but they start somewhere where most of us, where most people find untenable, which is that person had a house. They had somewhere to start. That person had somebody to go out and find them and draw them in because their life had never had the opportunity where somebody actually wanted to draw them in and show them what community was about. And so that's the type of stuff that's hard to do that creates some of these kind of consistent systems and consistent cycles. This is my experience. And then sometimes I find like the attitude because like you said, we're income deserve so then when we design as architects or building designers you're designing for that class of people so it sort of becomes this like if you're going to give people houses they're not going to be the nicest places to live and it doesn't have to be about being big but it's like the design solutions we use are not with empathy i guess like um, they should just be happy they have a house yeah exactly and it's, it doesn't it's not considered like how nice is the lighting of the space do they have access to gardens do they have access to those communal areas so they can be engaged, like, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So like, from an architectural design sense, like, what can you actually do? Like, what is our skill set and what can we kind of do to accommodate for those kind of problems? Yeah. I think there's lots to be said for, you know, in the work that you guys do, finding a way to maybe honor the humanity of the people that you're designing for. You, know, you can design a low-income building, is it a box because it's functional and that's kind of all they need? Or you can say, this is somebody's home. And we want them to love being there, not just because they finally get somewhere, but because it's actually a nice home to be in. It's a nice apartment to be in, it's a nice complex, it's a nice whatever, as opposed to they should be happy, they get anything. And I'm not saying that's necessarily the kind of, you're sitting down at like a table being like, well, they'll be happy with this and here's a square, and you know, square parts. But that idea of saying, just because the person who's the end user has experienced immense struggle for their life, during their life, doesn't then dissuade or kind of reduce the value that person has as kind of the immutable value as a human being. So how do you kind of weave those things into what you're doing and realizing the struggle that that type of person has experienced their whole life and what they need to thrive and survive? Um, it's hard. My brother-in-law has an exceptionally severe case of schizophrenia. And so for him to function in society is almost impossible. But right on site where he is, he's got counselors, he's got the support systems, because that's exactly where they need to be. Because he will not phone somebody. He doesn't, when he's not in a good space, he doesn't have the capacity for that. He needs things right there, readily accessible, that will see him spiraling, versus hoping he can reach out and ask. You know, that's a design feature. Is there an office right there with people that can see and be available to him when he needs them? They can see him wandering out to go find a drug dealer and be like, hey, we're, what's going on? Where are you at? And have people present. That's a design feature that allows for that in the space, which may or may not exist in you know, any low-income housing unit. They might just be a bunch of houses kind of stacked together, and there you go. You guys got a house. Be happy. Yeah? I don't know if this is taking Speaking to, um, and I'm not very familiar with this, but there's all sorts of, I guess, sort of policies with the idea that new development has a certain percentage of low income or sort of like more affordable housing. Yep. And in your experience, like, how, how does that end up working out? How does that sort of mixing? Um, 
out. Yeah. Um, so from a design, yeah. So two thoughts. One, I think it's really important to do. Um, by and large, through my experience and through walk, you know, talking with folks who run other charities and other not-for-profits doing work with people who are experiencing any measure of marginalization, the key to addressing that from a social issue or a social standpoint is proximity. If you have spent time with somebody who's been homeless or a number of people have been homeless, you're far, you're far more likely to feel like you understand why and to not blame that person. Because when you start talking to them and you hear their story, it is often not their fault. They have done every, they had never had a chance, some of them. My wife was a, uh, a chaplain at a closed custody facility for young offenders. And she'd go in and read the file and figure out kind of who this kid was and why they were there. And these kids never had a chance. They had a single parent who was a drug addict who sold drugs from their house. And lo and behold, this kid stole some stuff for some drugs. Yep. Yeah. That kid didn't, like, if that kid got out... That's you know kind of the exception that proves the rule that he never really had a chance because that's amazing that he had that he ever did. And when that kid comes back from structure, if that kid is in jail, where does he go back to? A community where he knows nobody, or to the people that he knew, which got him into jail in the first place? He never had a chance. And if you meet that kid and you talk to him and you realize, a, this is a child. He's like 13 or 14 years old, and his whole life has already been scripted out for him in some sense. He's gone to jail already. His whole social system is around, you know, deviant behavior. Those are the only people he knows, the only people who care about him. What, you start to realize this isn't as much his fault as we like to think it is. And so I think when you start to have the concept of proximity, the more that you're around people, the more you actually interact on a one-to-one -one level with somebody who's experienced any of these types of marginalizations, you start to realize what that's like, why, and start to then move from judgment into empathy. So I think the idea of creating these types of opportunities is really important, not just so that there are spaces, not just so that there are enough kind of rent geared to income homes in the community, because it actually has a massive impact on how we as a society are able to interact with people. Um, the work I do right now around disability, which has come to the other side, I'm trying to make like an accessible, they were looking at some of the, the places that we do our work, and they would you know, make X number of kind of accessible units like they're supposed to. And then the other units aren't accessible, so they can't go see their neighbors. Hmm. So here's this person who's in a wheelchair. They can get into their apartment. They are in a complex of 40 other units, and they can only talk to other people with disability because nothing else is accessible to them. They want to go outside and go to the townhouses that are in the complex. There's not, they're not accessible. They're not ramps. They're steps. They can't go meet their neighbors. So they can't actually get out and be involved in the community because it wasn't designed for them. They were the add-on that they had to do. So they put in a couple of spaces so they can meet their requirements, and off they go. And now this group who are trying to create proximity, trying to create community, trying to say it's important for us all to do this together, is isolated in their own community because they can't actually get out because it wasn't designed. It wasn't actually designed, or they weren't. They were an afterthought or a requirement as opposed to a desire. Yeah. So um, when I used to live in New York, I went to this one architect forum that was on redeveloping Far Rockaway. And it was amazing because Far Rockaway is a really poor part of New York. There were people there because the subway station is not, there's only one subway stop for all of Far Rockaway that had never left and never gone into greater New York. And I was just like, how, how can they ever get out? And then I remember I went to Chicago one time and my friend and I were like, oh great, look at these beautiful modernist buildings, they're, they're, let's go to them. And it was actually the projects. And there wasn't even a store open. There was like no subway transportation. They were in the middle of downtown Chicago. And how could these people, how could those kids ever get any opportunities? So. Yeah, yeah it's, it's hard. It, there are a lot of, I think we start to, when you start to, and this is why I think it comes to your question around the value of these things. The more that you dig into and the more there's the opportunity for the proximity, the more that you interact with somebody who's experiencing these things, the more you realize the far-reaching implications, the more you realize how broad these things are, and again, how many options somebody really had. My, uh, my mother-in-law is a medical researcher, and she's an expert in diabetes. And uh, I was reading one of her articles that she'd written. It was called, Am I, Am I My Brother's Keeper? And it was this idea around, like, do I, <laughs> I kind of have to care, and 
opportunity and choice. And well, everybody has a choice, and you can choose to eat healthy things. And especially around diabetes, diet is a massive, uh, massive indicator. But she kind of made the point, and I think this is the stuff that we can kind of miss. You know, what choice does a person, you know, a single parent with multiple kids living in a low-income neighborhood have versus a medical researcher who has no kids? Like, she can afford a gym membership and multiple pairs of shoes and can go whenever she wants and has a flexible work schedule because she is a, you know, a powerful woman and can make these types of choices. But another person who has choices, those choices include, can I feed my kids or pay the rent? And if you're making those choices, you don't have a gym membership, you don't have running shoes. Even if she did have running shoes, is it safe for her to go running at night in downtown wherever? And if she does, who's watching her kids? So all of a sudden, how does this person get exercise? How does this person address their diabetes? So it's any of we all have choices. But that's where you start to get into what are the actual impacts of those choices, what choices actually existed for. You have a parent that doesn't understand, that, you have a parent with low literacy, which is another issue that does exist in the region. The literacy group is right around the corner of the John Howard building. They teach people how to read. If your parent doesn't know how to read, how are you ever going to apply for college? You're a 15-year-old, having to apply for university, you don't have a lot of social supports, you don't know it's, it's not working, and your parents can't even read. What, you know, it's like that, you know, you need somebody to help you, and you're hoping that maybe the guidance counselor helps me. What are the odds of that person getting any work? Yeah. Um, so a lot of this discussion has been about uh, parents with children. So I, we obviously sure. have seen in the region, um, there's a lot of young parents, like very young parents, and I was wondering what are what are the resources like young parents have? Like very, there are a lot of very young parents. Yep. Um, so. Or is it, does that just work that they they're not so, with their parents too? Or? It depends. So it depends on what, depends on a lot of factors. So whatever resources exist for a parent exist for a young parent. Right. If you are a young parent living at home with, you know, a parent has, you know, let's say, uh, pull it out. since it's been a little while, I could grab the numbers so that I could not make stuff up. Um, if, so for instance, we were talking about if you're on OW, if your dependent has a dependent, you get an extra $350 a month. So if you were a parent and you had a 16 year old who happened to have a child, you get $350 more a month to help support that child. Anybody here, parents, by chance? Yeah, any idea how expensive kids are? <laughs> the answer is exceptionally. <laughs> Diapers are expensive, formula is expensive. Like, first couple of months, my wife, for medical reasons, wasn't able to breastfeed. We were spending hundreds of dollars a month on formula. We would have tore through this 350 some odd dollars in like the first three weeks of a month just in formula and diapers. Like, so it's not a lot. So there are extra supports in that sort of sense. There are lots of programs that support families, whatever the makeup of them. Um, the Family Outreach Program, which exists, is sponsored through the region of Waterloo. If you are a family in the region, you have access to food security, you can access to transportation, you know, free bus tickets, you can get a whole bunch of, a whole number of things. But again, what you get gets you to better than you were, but it's nowhere near good. I think that's one of the major so problems. So is education also a problem then? Because why are there so many, is, in this region, like maybe that's a rude question, no, but like fine. there's so many team lines. Yep. Um, so Cambridge specifically will have, it just tends to be a lower income area. Lower income areas tend to have, it's again kind of more systemic. Like that's just kind of, it tends <laughs> It tends to happen in low-income areas, and there are a myriad of social reasons as to why that is. You've got less engaged parents in some ways. You've got the reality that, um, to start with less engaged parents, there's not somebody around making sure the kids are doing the best. Thing. You've got people who are not kind of looking forward to like their future. So are they being careful about what they're going to do if they're going to be out? You know, if they're out with a partner, are they like, well, you know, what about my future? I want to go to school. They don't. That's not even in their mindset because it was never given to them as an option. So they're not as concerned about it. So it tends to kind of happen with low-income families where there is a lot of you know, teen or younger pregnancy. It's not 
only in that area, but it does have a disproportionate number of things. And so because Cambridge is a lower income area as it relates to the rest of the region, there tends to be more, but it's not a, yeah, and it, it's not necessarily a, I don't, from my experience, it hasn't been necessarily because of an education issue, it's because of a myriad of social issues that, again, they don't have a ton of, they don't have a ton of control over themselves. They were not given the things to succeed in a lot of ways. Um, in terms of access, that does that make sense? In, just in terms of accessing resources like for families, like, sure. you, like you were saying, um, navigating the system must be difficult. I'm, I'm just, I guess, wondering how often people don't access resources they could be just because they, they don't know about them or they don't know how to find them. It's a good question. Um, it's kind of one of those good questions that I can't have an answer for because if I knew yeah. how many people weren't, we'd probably yeah. be looking at how to no, get them more engaged. Um, anecdotally, I would say a lot. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, there's a myriad of things at play as to why somebody wouldn't access services beyond just awareness. Yeah. Um, have you, here's a good question. Have any of you ever had to prove your income to get anything? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> How about like, I don't know, food? If you had to like go up to somebody and say, I need some help with food, and they're like, all right, just let me make sure that you're poor enough. How many times do you feel like you'd be comfortable doing that before you don't want to go and ask? They say, I need help getting to the doctor with my kid. I can't afford the bus. And they're like, all right, just bring in your, you know, your T4 or your thing or any, any sort of documentation around you know, your OW slips, whatever it is, just make sure that you prove that you're poor enough to need this. You want to get your kid into soccer, and they say, great, yeah, we'd love to get you in, just, you can get a subsidy, you just got to come and kind of beg for it, and stuff. And that comes from this desire, well-intentioned to be accountable, to make sure that it's going to the right people, and it just requires you then to have to defend that you are poor enough to need help to stranger after stranger after stranger after stranger everywhere you go, because the supports are not like you stopped at one spot and got everything. I saw this when I lived in um, Montreal, I lived in uh, Point St. Charles, which historically is one of the poorest neighborhoods in Montreal, but then it's become rapidly gentrified. And Point St. Charles had two very interesting things that started at the model for all of Montreal. It had this kind of local health plan, and then we also had a parents group that offered $7 per afternoon with child care. So it was there for the poor parents. And um, there was a breastfeeding group and it was originally intended to encourage lower income women to breastfeed, and it was all full, and I went to it, it was all full of middle class women. And those of us who used the uh, parents group uh, daycare was the same thing, so we could go run errands. And it was just really interesting to see that those services that were designed for our lower income neighbors, and I had one of my neighbors had like five kids who were never dressed properly, like it didn't look like the parents were. I never saw them engage in those services. And there was no need to actually prove their income for those. So I don't know, were we creating a space that they, didn't, they, didn't, they felt excluded from, right? Probably. I remember I was really, we had a conversation at the community center around, so our programs were exceptionally accessible, same sort of stuff. We had subsidies on request. We didn't try and make people prove those types of things. Um, I remember having a conversation, kind of half joking as I'm sipping this now. Um, I didn't allow my staff to drink Starbucks uh, when programs were going on because you can imagine what it would be like to come in and say, I can't afford this program. I'm getting it for free or for $2 a week and have the person running it drinking more in coffee than you can afford to spend on food in a month. They come four times a week you know, or three times a week and they're drinking a $7 coffee every time. It creates a right away at, at them and us sort of situation where we were talking about what to do when we were at a March break camp and how do you talk to kids and, you know, after things like, or a summer camp, was, summer camp's an easier example, and they're saying, how do you kind of get engaged with kids and talk about that? And, you know, they're like, well, you know, ask them, like, what they're doing for vacation. I was like, what do you think they're doing for vacation? They're like, I don't know. They're like, nothing. They're coming to summer camp on a subsidy because they can't afford to go anywhere. What do you think they're doing the rest of the week? Like, going camping and then going on a trip out east? Like, they're, they're sitting at home. 
So even just being aware of what the options that were afforded to a lot of the young people involved in our programs and the way we address and try to identify. Because as you start asking those types of questions, you're starting to alienate the child because they don't feel comfortable and they realize that you don't know what it's like to be them and you don't really get to understand that. And so they start to back off. So I've been rambling in a whole bunch of different directions as kind of my mind wanders, which is related to having three little kids. Uh, <laughs> Anything of interest, we kind of talked about a whole bunch of topics, kind of at a relatively high level. Anything that kind of stood out that you like, I'd like to know more about, or what do we do about, or that sounds like you're making stuff up, I'm more than okay for you to kind of tell me that I don't make anything. Anything of interest in any of that as we've been kind of chatting around for the last little bit? Yeah. Yeah. Go, go. Go. Um, I'm finding kind of interesting how you were saying, like, the gap between the services that you get when you don't have a job and the services that you lose when you get a minimum wage job. And it seems like politically it would be easier to defend offering services to people who have minimum wage jobs because if we're saying that they need to earn it in, in a way it. So why is it that they have like why can't we provide more services to people with minimum wage jobs so that they don't feel like there's such a big jump between the job that they have to get before it's worth going off OW? I don't know. I don't, so I just, sorry, it's not a simple answer, I guess. Yeah. There are reasons that would say you could, there are, they've been playing with that system for a long time around how much you get to keep and whether it's a sliding scale or a percentage of or a dollar for dollar or all sorts of things. Anybody ever been on like, employment insurance, PI? They've been playing with that, piloting around how to make this stuff work because you try and fix it, but there's also that point where you don't want to be, they want, to disincentivize people being on OW. They want to incentivize them back to work. So letting you work and be on OW doesn't incentivize you to get off. But with so, like childcare and other kinds of services that are not like directly money, but the types of, right, like health insurance and the types of things that prevent people from being Yeah, so they, there would be options. Some of it's also just a, like a dollar for dollar issue. The system doesn't support it, doesn't have enough, and so it has to go where it has to go because if you're comparing, I don't know, if you're voting here, let's say in Cambridge, what's going to get the vote? A new rec center or low-income housing? A better roads or, you know, free childcare for people who work minimum wage? It's going to go to the better roads because the people who vote and the people who are engaged and loud tend to have a measure of affluence and that's who they're trying to court. So that's to kind of play to their stereotypes and play to their desires in some ways. So. Some of it's just like a pure funding thing, where there isn't enough money to go around to do what needs to be done. Some of it's also a design issue, where there aren't really good answers, which is kind of with the constraints that exist, there aren't particularly good answers. So yes, you could do so, and there are some programs that work for kind of working for, they just, you end up shifting around where that gap exists. So if it's, you know, let's say, you know, you would then be able to keep it up until like $17 an hour, you make too much, and you kind of lose all of your benefits, then like you need, where is the job where you get benefits again? Probably not at 20 or 30, like, and does it, it just shifts around that gap because that gap exists for everybody. There's just a question of, you know, if you move past a living wage, it probably starts to create some better equity. Living wage, I think, in the region right now is about 16, 70 an hour, I believe, for a family of four. Um, but, you know, that then becomes a pet peeve of mine. If we talk about like something like living wage, people will say, then we'll have to pay more for stuff. So we can't actually, you know, that will inflate prices on gas and food and all these things in the region. Blaming people who don't make enough versus like a company that's going to be predatory and inflate that price. So you're kind of blaming the wrong person here. Saying, well, you know, those poor people should just be happy to have a job versus saying, no, they deserve a living wage. And if everybody racks up their prices, we should scream at the corporations who are taking advantage of us. Instead, we blame poor people for being poor. It's like saying to a refugee, no, you can't come here because we don't know, you know who you are and what's coming. It's like we're blaming them for the attack that is happening to them. They are being attacked by horrific, thing, you know, horrific things are happening in Syria. This family is at the end of that, getting you know, physically harmed. And then we say, no, because you might be one of them. So they're being blamed by the very thing that they're trying to and you know, reject it because of the very thing they're trying to do. We're blaming the wrong person. And the same sort of thing happens when you talk about living wage or wage increases, those types of things. You end up blaming... Because a company says, well, we can't afford this. Yes, you can if you made a little less. But because they're incentivizing by law, have to make as much as they can, they'll argue that they'll just raise their prices. 
and blame, well, why do they need to make this much money? And you know, it's going to inflate prices for everybody else. And as soon as you start talking about selfishly, I don't want to pay more, so then that poor person doesn't actually get to get a real wage. So a whole bunch of economic systems all kind of conspiring at once. I don't know if that answers your question yeah. a little bit. Yeah. Um, I haven't heard a lot about it, but I suspect it'll happen, whether it's a worry or not. Like, are we, like, we're renting all over the city? Is that pushing out? <laughs> I mean, I'm just. Yeah, no, I understand. Trying trying. To think of I, I think gentrification is a thing that's going to happen, and. The approach to something like gentrification is probably more in it's probably in policy more than anything. So, and this is where you know if you are a concerned citizen, do we press the city to say it's important that we don't gentrify out people who need to or who whose home this is now for other things because they're going to be incentivized to bring in it's in their interest to bring in people who have and spaces that have affluence. So. That's a policy issue, I think, more than to a certain extent a design issue, unless, you know, yeah, I think it's probably a policy thing. Because the policies allow for big money and money to buy up and then create expensive places where people can't. That's not necessarily a function of, it's a market issue as opposed to a function of whether you designed a nice building or not. You can design a nice building, you don't set the prices on it. And the requirement for accessible units within that isn't set by the designer as well. It's going to be the policy. So if that's meaningful to you as a designer, policy with the place is time your time and saying, we don't want this to be gentrified. And as such, how do we maintain supports for the people who live here now? That would be my kind of off the top of my head thought. What can we do as like, apart from our architectural skill set, mm -hmm. is there a like, really press need for volunteers at like the shelter or like a, a food distribution center or like, like sure. would that be of use? Yeah. yeah. I think it, so it's for two reasons. I think A, most places are always looking for volunteers because it's hard and it's nice to get more people involved. Helps with the concept right to the back to, you know, however long ago. Proximity for you guys is helpful because I think the proximity helps to create more civically, in, in, more civically aware <coughs> Um, members of the community, more engaged members, that then when we start to talk about, when the concept of gentrification comes up, you're now not thinking of gentrification, you're thinking of, but what about so-and-so from the shelter? Where are they going to go? This is now a person as opposed to an idea. This is, but what about all the stuff going on when the food bank can't afford to be downtown anymore? What happens to all the, the good that's going on there? Like, it's right across from the bus station. If it moves, how hard is that for people to get to? It's already hard. Now it's like it's in personal investment as opposed to some sort of ethereal idea. So I think the proximity thing is particularly helpful there. And not-for-profits tend to want as many volunteers as they can because it's hard. And different ways to engage different groups and those sort of things. You guys are lucky. Like so, Cambridge yourself Help Food Bank is a block and a half that way. Bridges is right there. John Howard Society, a literacy group. Whatever you're kind of interested in around, kind of whatever engages you. If you're interested in you know helping. You know, literacy, if you're interested in mental health, if you're interested in food security, if you're interested in, you know, discrete homelessness, like, there is a place within walking distance you can do that here if you want to get involved in the community. They all exist. They're easy to find. Most of them are looking for help. Yeah, I'm just thinking, like, I don't know anybody from Cambridge. I don't know. And I think that's probably... Typical of most people. Yeah. It's very much like us versus the locals. Well, it's an enclave unto itself in some yeah. ways, right? And that's where you spend your time. And there's nothing discreetly wrong with that. But the measure of intentionality can be helpful, again, to say, if we are going to be here, how do we be a part of here versus kind of travelers through, mm -hmm. if that's meaningful. Um, remember, there was a... Uh, there was a group of people that I 
did some work with, and they were doing some kind of development work and stuff, kind of some international development work and all that kind of things, and sending out groups and stuff like that. And I said, how much does your, like, your neighbors love you guys? And they said, I don't know, they kind of don't like us. I said, that is, I said, what do you mean? They're like, well, you know, we bring all these people in, they're kind of getting trained and stuff and going out, and it's you know, kind of, you know, there's not a lot of local folks there. And I said, that is ridiculous. You bring in all of these people from all over to train to do development work. In the place that you're in, which is not a particularly like affluent area, which could use, I don't know, some development work, hates you. Did you have any idea how ridiculous that is? Like, you're going to go across the world to try and help somebody who needs help when your neighbor beside you don't know their name, but they are struggling because of where you're living because you don't have enough to pay for an apartment, and neither do they. How are you not supporting and investing in that too? I mean, there's sometimes there's that ability to kind of say, you know, I'm not from here, this isn't going to be here for long, but to say, like, there should be some cursory benefits to saying, I'm here now. This person kind of matters now. Is there a way to be supportive and invested in that for the time that I'm here? It doesn't mean forever. But again, that proximity stuff, I think, will serve you well as you grow, as you kind of age into the society and realize what this stuff looks like. And you start to hear things and realizing that it's not as simple as any one political side wants to make it be or as you know, easy as saying this person is good or bad. Um, yeah, like I think of, I think of, you know, so we, uh, my wife and I and a group of people that we know sponsored a Syrian family to come in and we've been working with them kind of been something almost a year now, I guess. It'll be a year in February at some point. Um, and so we hear people talk about like Syrians and how dangerous it is and you know, which bring people into countries and all that kind of stuff and how much money they get and how they get more than all of this. It's like, first-hand knowledge, that is not true. And these are lovely people. They are fantastic and warm, and they are trying their best. They, just like everybody else, do stupid things, but like so did I. They're young. They're like in their 20s. When I was in my 20s, they did a lot of really stupid things. <laughs> it's, so it's just kind of like they're just people. But the proximity then says when somebody posts something ludicrous on Facebook and be like, you ever talk to a refugee? Because the 30 that I know, none of them are like that. How many do you know? You start to get into that conversation. Well, you know, if people just worked harder, they wouldn't be poor. Really? Because all the people that I know experiencing any measure of poverty are working really hard or would love to work hard if somebody would give them a job. Here's, this is, plays at the worst parts of you, so I'm sorry for this. Like, you can probably, if you want, like when you're walking around, you're in a store, just, you do it subconsciously, just be, pay, pay attention to it. You can tell who's poor and who's not by how they look. You can tell by their smile, the teeth, what's around their eyes. You can tell. Imagine if you're an employer then. That person comes in. You've got somebody who you know, dresses like they're supposed to. And then somebody who comes in who looks poor. Who's getting the job? That's not on them. They're trying. This is a person, a single mom, working two jobs, but still doesn't have enough. And the answer here is, well, if they worked harder, they would be OK. I don't think they're working hard. It's because nobody kind of cares about them. The system isn't designed to care about them. I think that's the kind of stuff that you start to realize and have empathy for and then start to care about what does that mean and how do I get involved and what does my investment look like? How do I lend my skill, knowledge, privilege, whatever you want to say, to that? Because I have a lot of that. When I talk about, when I talk about privilege, I am like the definition of privilege. I am a white male. I have been given... Um, I am from Canada. I have been given every sort of advantage. I have a university degree. I am now in charge of my second charity. Like, right from the start, they put me in the leadership positions. I have every sort of privilege in the world. There's nothing kind of that stands as a barrier to me. You know, I am, like, straight, cisgendered, anything you want to, like, you want to check privilege, I check every single box. So what the question is then, what do I do with that? Try and lend that privilege, lend that awareness, lend any of this experience out to say when somebody who from my circle which, you know, unfortunately tends to have a lot of privilege and it says something stupid to be like, that is not true. That is not what happens with refugees. That is not why people are poor. They work really frigging hard. They don't want to be. And the awareness, like even just, we said, none of you probably guessed and none of you knew. $470 a month. Who wants to live like that? You know what? People just want to be on OW. They just want to be on welfare. It's easy. They get a free ride. They don't have to do anything. Who wants to live like that, honestly? If given the choice, how many people do you think actually would choose that? That persistent idea that poor people are just lazy and they want to choose that, they want to live off the system. They don't want to. They don't feel like there's other choices, no other options. 
They walk in looking poor. They don't know how to write there. They don't write particularly well because they don't have a good education. Like none of this stuff is going to give them the opportunity to get a job. They've been told that by people for their entire life, so they stop trying. They don't want that. They would love to have more, but it even seemed like the beginning of an idea of something they could actually grasp, but it was beat out of them by the system long before they had a chance. And so they don't invest that into their kids and teach their kids that they have a chance or that they're valuable or meaningful because the system has said to them, you're not valuable and meaningful. We hate you because you're lazy and you don't do enough. You just leech from us. And so what do they do? They internalize that and lo and behold, off they go. They end up on a W-2. Not because that's what they want. It's like the kid whose parents, you know, it's like the kid who grew up in a crack house. Didn't have a shot. And sure. again, all of that exists in Cambridge, like within walking distance of where you are right now. This isn't some sort of thing that exists in Toronto or Vancouver or Montreal, like though it does. But it, you don't have to go there to find it. Talk about addiction issues, the fentanyl crisis that's drifting into our region is massive here, in our region. Not just kind of this out there sort of thing. Massive number of refugees who have been, you know, resettled in our region. This is not an out there stuff. This is not, well, things would be more interesting if I was in Toronto, if I was in here, you know, it'd be, if there was real poverty like there is in Scarborough or something. No, it is right here. It's just easy to miss when we're not looking or don't care to find it. And that's where, again, that proximity stuff you stop being able to ignore it. You stop being able to walk by it and not see it. Because now it's not an idea. It's a person. It's that guy that you knew. I remember I was sitting at the... Uh, we were working with the Ray of Hope, which is in Kitchener. Uh, they have a community center. They do kind of free meals every night. That sort of stuff. And I was there doing some volunteering with my friends. And my brother was having a conversation with... this really interesting guy. He kind of came over and he told me about it afterwards. He was a zoologist. Do you know how many positions there are for zoology? Not a lot. <laughs> Had a job, was doing okay. Couldn't get a job, you know, got, lost his job. Not a lot of other zoology jobs. Became homeless. And then this is where you run into a problem. What, just, what do you put on a resume, just out of curiosity? What, what are like the really important things to have on a resume? Like at the basic level, ba even more basic than that. What do you need on a resume? Address. An address, a phone number, your name. You're homeless, and you want to put out a resume and then say, and like, I'll be back in a week to see if you're interested, because what do you put there? The shelter? They're going to call the shelter and say, hey, this is the shelter. Oh, like, what, how do you even do that? You can't afford a phone. So how do you even apply for a job? And that was his problem. He was sitting there being like, what do I do? I've been out of work now for five years. He's homeless. He's now not up to speed on the science of zoology. Doesn't have anything to put down for his address, so... He stayed homeless. What could even be a solution to that, though? Like, uh, beyond, yeah. like... Wouldn't it be, like, an option for, like, shelters to have sort of a separate phone number that... So there are, there, there are... And I don't say that to say, like, there's no hope, but it's just, it's the... I say that to just draw the attention to it is so much harder than we would like to think it is to sort this sort of a problem and for somebody who's in this problem to have a real solution. Because the answers become simple. Why don't they just get a job? Have you considered the steps to getting a job and how many barriers there are for this person? You don't have a home, there's no number, there's no address. Somehow you find out about this, but what does a homeless person have to wear to a job interview? And then they go, and how did they get a hold of them again to say they did or did not get? Like, there are so many barriers built right into just the process of applying, let alone the fact that they probably don't have job experience for the past couple of years because they've been homeless. Wants to hire somebody with a job experience. Like, it just it compounds so fast and so oppressively, they don't have chances. And so there's tons of good work around that. There are in town here. There are places where you can get, um, you know, clothing, you know, for jobs. So you can get like a suit and a tie and things to look professional for somebody who's experiencing any pressure. That stuff exists, so some people have noticed this and are trying to address those problems, but there is so much less there to address the problem than there is need that it continues to persist. So yes, there are solutions, but they're just not kind of enough in some ways because it's there, and again, we would rather, in a lot of ways, a lot of places would rather not. Like who is, not a lot of corporations that are saying we're gonna purposefully hire homeless people. There are some. 
Not a lot. You're going to purposely hire people who have a disability. There are some, but not a lot. Yeah. Again, anything that's kind of stood out or of interest as we're kind of jumping around homelessness and poverty and all that kind of fun? Any this last is, questions? Yeah. This is probably super insensitive, but... Um, Sorry. <laughs> Uh, what 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 do you uh, what do you do when a homeless person uh, uh, approaches you? How do you react? Like uh, like you ethereal you or like you me? As in, I, I guess <laughs> I guess uh, I guess because I know uh, I'm always hurrying back and forth from school and uh, like they're they're usually asking for change and so, yeah. I know. One of the things that I found in this, as I continue to harp on this issue of proximity, I try and create space in my day for everybody. Like, there's a sense of how do you have time to notice the world around you? There's some measure of intentionality. You want to start, you know, go out from here and say, okay, tomorrow, if I am rushing to class, if I left five minutes earlier, would I notice what's around me a little bit more? Would I notice my community, notice the people? Maybe you walk by the same person every day and have no idea you're walking by because they're walking to work and you're walking to class. There's community all around us. We kind of don't create space or time or are aware of what's happening. When it comes to somebody who's homeless, you know, if you're walking by the same homeless person every day, you know, I would, if it's me, I tend to try and, you know, often I've said hi, try and, you know, do things. I try if I have money to give some. I had a long conversation with somebody who was a uh, worked with street involved people, and there's a question around like, do you give money to a panhandler or not? And there was a whole bunch of kind of questions around what you should or not because the que- the overwhelming argument was because they will use it for drugs. So, um, I, I remember in uh, I think a couple terms ago, I had a really off putting interaction where uh, there was a homeless person. In she uh, she said she was hungry and she uh, and I I happened to like I just came from Giant Tiger mm-hmm. so I had uh, like bread that I freshly brought yep. bought and I offered some but she's like no uh, I, I I just want money for um, for presumably uh, going to the bar for a drink yep. and I just found that really uh, off putting sure. So there's, well, there's two things there. One is, um, somebody who has an addictions issue is going to feed their addiction first. I don't know if you guys know much about addictions. That comes first all the time. So when somebody says, I'm not going to give them money because then they're going to go buy drugs. It's like, the drugs are a given. If they don't get enough money, they're going to steal it. They're going to break into it. The drugs are a given. If they have too much money, they'll probably buy something to eat because at some point they will want that but it comes after all of the addictive issues so when you're talking to somebody that's homeless like well if I give them this money they're going to go buy drugs it's like the, the drugs are happening you can't stop that but at a certain point they might also buy some food if somebody if they're invested in enough so there's a bit of that the other side of it is, is around I'll use a different example because it's not perfect to what you were talking about kind of those off-putting experiences but um, so if the refugee family that we sponsored, like I said, make some interesting choices that I would not agree with. Um, and the group that we were working with found that to be exceptionally hard. They'd say, well, why are they spending their money like this? They can't do that. They shouldn't do this. And somewhere in there, we had to unpack the idea that you, these are not your children. These are autonomous adults who get to make choices with the resource that we have said is for them. So this person, who is a person, indelible value as a person, says, what is most important to me is to buy an expensive cell phone that was nicer than the cell phone I have, and that's what the refugee family did. It's kind of his choice. I can't, like, I don't get, why do I get to judge and say no to that and to control that person and say, you need to act the way that I say, or I'm taking away my support? Because very quickly, my support isn't then because you're a person who deserves support or deserves my investment. You get what you get if you do what I tell you. You become like a nanny. And that's the type of stuff that gets really tricky really quickly when we start to invest. Saying, does this person get to have agency? Does a person who's experiencing marginalization and poverty get to have choice in their life at all? Or do they only get to live life as we want them to under our parameters? I don't know. Like I think of this question 
so like I said, I do work with people experiencing disability. A question that we ask all the time, a person experiencing disability who would have, let's say, multiple sclerosis and can't have, doesn't have full function of their arms, who would like to have a glass of wine? Should you know, a support person pour them one? Probably. Why not? You know, there's no problem there. If that person wants to have five bottles of wine, should a support person pour that for them? Probably not, because you're going to cause them some sort of harm. But if I was, you know, if they want a bottle of wine, would a support person pour that for them? I don't know, if I was at home and I wanted to drink a bottle of wine, I get to make that choice. Does that person get to make that choice? If I had extra money and I wanted to go, and it, I don't say this because it's, you did the wrong thing by anything, so please don't hear me that way. If I had extra money and wanted to go to a bar and get a bunch of drinks, I can. But because this person lives on the street, they don't get to do that. Why does that, they, I am now valuing their choices. I am judging and saying this is what you do and do not get to do it. And part of the answer is because it's my money. And that's not necessarily wrong, but I'm just pushing it to say, let's be aware of what we're saying then. You get my generosity only if, or you get this because you will. And there's some sort of these, which starts to get into some odd implications and some odd sort of tensions around why somebody does or does not deserve anything. What kind of agency a person who experiences nothing. I remember there was a person who lived near us and they came over one day and like they bought everybody at the center like pizza, which was great, and it cost like $70. And I was like, how do they have money for this? Like, I can't afford to buy $70 worth of pizza for everybody. I work for charity. I'm like, and, but the answer was like, because that's what they get to choose. They chose to want to invest this way and it's gonna make some other implications in their life, but they get to make that choice. And that's what we're trying to afford them is the opportunity, whether good or bad, to make choices. And that agency shows care and value and a whole bunch of other things. It's just sometimes complex and sometimes you watch people with choices do things you don't think they should and sometimes hurt themselves. But that's not a function of them being poor, it's a function of them being a person. Lots of really rich people make stupid choices, but nobody seems to care that rich people do it. You know, if you're rich and you drink a bunch and crash a car, you might get out of it. If you're poor and drink a bunch and pass out on the street, you're a bad person. The only difference there is one of them has money. Okay, Phil, I think we're going to have to end the conversation there, but thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for talking to us. And Also, sorry if that was super depressing. <laughs> <laughs> Look, kind of listen, it's kind of depressing, I realize. I apologize for that. Yeah. Uh, okay, Danielle has one more question. Right. Just how, do, how do you stay positive in your line of work? And what, okay. what keeps you going? <laughs> yeah. um, the good stories. There are... The... The times that you get to kind of see like the spark of life come back into somebody who hasn't had it for years. Like that person I told you about, that, that woman who like was shut in and then started volunteering. Like that's the kind of things like she is living a richer, fuller life because of the work that we were doing. And that's meaningful. And you know, a, because I am of the opinion that every person matters deeply, the number of lives that have that impact on is less important than seeing that it happens. And so I try and lean into that and say this. Is there, there are, there's times where somebody's come and said, I need food, and I didn't have any. I turn them away, and it makes me feel awful. But you're trying to remember the times where you were able to help and realize that while the system might not be different than it was yesterday, for that person, it's kind of like that really, like that, oh, I hate it. That, like, starfish example where they talk about throwing starfish in the ocean. I assume you guys have heard this before. It's like, well, you know, you throw them in. You can't possibly fix them all, but, like, it matters to that one. Remembering that that person is a person. They matter deeply, and them having a better day matters to me then because they are a person who matters simply because they are. So I try and lean into that as much as possible. Yeah. Okay, thanks so much. Thanks.